He spent six years in New York City completing training in medical oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center before joining the faculty at UW in 2008. He leads a research lab in a statewide cancer genomics program. Today, he will speak about the efforts with colleagues at UW Cancer Center to improve precision oncology. Welcome, Mark. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and uh, it's not often I get to a rotary meeting, so it's great to see the other important things you do with vaccinations and everything else. Um, when we talk about genetics and genes, what, what do people think about? Yeah? I don't want to answer the question, oh, yeah. but can you step in front of the laptop? This is, this oh, is the camera. Okay, so people the camera. Okay. Yeah. What do people think about? Heredity. Heredity. Any other thoughts? <clears throat> Certain diseases. Certain diseases that you might be predisposed to, yeah. right? Targeting genes or something like that? Targeting genes. Hey. We're gonna be talking about targeting genes a little bit today. CRISPR. But I wanted to, CRISPR is a good one? CRISPR. It says I have to unmute here. Oh no, just ignore that. The okay. mics here will catch you. All right. The reason I say this is because um, <clears throat> today I'm gonna to talk about cancer genes. And while you can have genes that are inherited that predispose you to cancer, when someone has cancer, it's a disease of a genetic change that happens in a healthy cell. And so um, most of the genes I'm going to talk about today are specific to the cancer and are not inherited in family. It's a, it's a genetic change or a mutation that happened in a normal cell to turn it into cancer. <clears throat> so um, that's what I want to talk about. You're going to drive. So <laughs> the first... The trap. Uh, the reason I'm talking about this is in part because of technology. When in 2001, we heard about the Human Genome Project, it was completed, it was great. We learned about what the human genome is. However, it was basically a disk of information that someone actually physically handed me, a DVD, with a sequence of letters that came from uh, you know, dozens of different people that was kind of mish, mixed together and felt to be human in general. It wasn't that useful because we couldn't apply it to individuals. So over the past 20 years, the NIH, our federal government, has invested in technologies to make that DNA testing, the human genome scale testing, accessible to individuals. And it's been applied to people where we can now sequence the human genome for about $1,000 a couple years ago. And it's been applied to cancers, which, as I said, the tumors are different than the person because they have some additional mutations that are unique and specific to the cancer. Now, why is this important? Um, because it turns out we used to classify cancers by where they came from. There's breast cancer, which is my specialty, lung cancer, colon cancer. You know, it, it's what surgeon you need. Uh, but it turns out, if you start doing DNA testing, not all breast cancers are the same. Not all colon cancers are the same. Not all lung cancers are the same. There's specific mutations that are unique to individuals. And more recently, if you find those mutations, you can find a drug to target them. So here's a couple FDA-approved drugs in breast cancer, uh, the PARP inhibitors and opalacid for specific genes, PARP inhibitor for BRCA1, Alpalacid for a gene called PIK3CA. The most uh, revolutionary change was for the first time on the right of the screen, there was an FDA approval for a drug that wasn't for breast cancer or lung cancer or colon cancer. It was for a genetic type of cancer, no matter where it came from. That was the first time that happened. And it's for a genetic type called MSI high cancer. Um, so when the technology changed and this became accessible, we and others began to ask, why don't we just do this for everyone with cancer? Uh, let's, let's just go ahead. Um, is this timed or are you controlling this? I'm controlling this. Okay, time. next. These are the reasons why. Cost too much. Insurance doesn't pay. Not many people have a drug that you can find. And there's a lot of other standard treatment options, mostly chemo. So 
people, you know, there are a lot of naysayers out there said, don't bother. And we said, we should do this and we should try to find a way to make it accessible for cancer patients at the UW Cancer Center, but also to everyone in Wisconsin, all the cancer patients, particularly those with metastatic cancer where they needed newer treatment options. So we started facing some problems. So the first problem was every doctor and every nurse in the clinic were deciding whether to do testing. So there was no central organization and then there was no central review of what to do with the testing. So we began to centralize it. We set up uh, this group called the Precision Medicine Molecular Tumor Board. Uh, I co-directed with Dusty Deming. The idea was we're the experts that are gonna help every oncologist in the state. Uh, we're gonna have genetics, uh, experts, pathology experts, ph pharmacy, pharmacists, and we're going to get together and we're going to help coordinate the testing and the review and make recommendations. And fortunately, with the advocacy of our chancellor and the dean, we actually got some money from the legislature there to coordinate this and to make it accessible, not just to people in Madison, but other health systems throughout the state. The second problem we, we uh, faced was people said, this isn't worth it. Why bother? Because if you do these tests on a few dozen patients, you're not going to have a clinical trial for those one in a hundred mutations. Until you have thousands of patients, are you going to be able to bring a, 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 a trial here for a mutation that you might find only rarely? So we said, okay, we need to streamline everything. So we started to streamline the whole process of uh, testing. We had a process in June of, in December of 2017, which was a little convoluted. It was about 20 patients a month. We advanced that um, later in 2018, uh, uh, where we streamlined it as much as possible and got coordinators to do that. And we're able to get to 50 a month. And then we, we kept going until we got to over 100 a month. And now every two weeks, we end up reviewing between 50 and 100 test results from Madison, but also uh, collaborating health systems in Gunderson, in La Crosse, Marshfield in Northern Wisconsin, Theta Care in Fox Valley. So, um, so once we had the volume, now we said, maybe now we can bring drugs here. So we'll find drugs. That might only work for one or two percent of people, but if we have, we can find those one or two percent. We can ask the companies to work with us because we're going to be a center that are going to find them. So we created this group. We call it a basket disease-oriented team, or DOT, in the UW Cancer Center. We created Jen Collins and Natalia Boa have been uh, instrumental leaders, and we began to um, bring multiple clinical trials. So. Not only were we testing patients, we had some options on the back end of newer therapies, uh, in addition to the standard ones, which were becoming approved over time. Next. So since the beginning, um, we've reviewed over 5,000 cases uh, throughout Wisconsin, as you can see. Um, and the numbers go up uh, year after year. 860 is about half, less than halfway into 2021. So. I hope we're going to beat our numbers from last year as we reach out to more and more patients. Now, in breast cancer, uh, we find some clinical trials, you know, every clinical trial or, or therapy is maybe only a few percent of patients, but it adds up. And so about 30% of our patients uh, found a clinical trial. At 8%, we found an off-label therapy, meaning a drug may be approved for lung cancer that could be reapplied based on the gene. And here's some of the genes that we found. Uh, HERB2, also known as HER2, sorry, you don't need to know this, but uh, estrogen receptor gets mutated. We find something called mutation rate or two mutational burden. These, there are all these genetic changes we can find in the cancer that help patients. So here's one example from uh, rural Western Wisconsin with our colleagues at Gunderson. This is a patient, I don't know, it's hard to see. I don't know if I can point here if people see my pointer. Probably not. But um, this is a PET scan. It shows white spots, which at the very top is a brain. Uh, but outside the lung on the left is all these bright spots that shouldn't be there. 
So those are areas of cancer that have grown, and what they're doing is they're taking up glucose, which shows up on this PET scan. <clears throat> so this patient had something that we very, very, very rarely find in breast cancer, maybe one in a thousand, it had a gene called MET. So we found a drug for this patient, and you can see in 22 weeks later, on the right, not all of it, but a lot of the cancer started melting away. And this was a pill that she could take once a day instead of chemo. So it didn't cure her, and unfortunately the cancer became resistant, but this process got another option of treatment. This wasn't a breast cancer patient. This is a gene, NTRK, that we find maybe in a one in a thousand breast cancers. It's very rare, or one in a thousand other cancers. But we found this in another type of cancer called GI stromal tumor, which was unexpected. And this was an unfortunate patient who had a large tumor in her abdomen here. You can see it here. Wow. This whole thing, these are the pelvic bones. Here's the liver. So the whole thing um, was a tumor and she was very ill from it. Um, we didn't know, but we did the test and found this NTRK1 gene. And that thing um, we had a drug for, and she's had a remarkable response where she went from, you know, nearly being more, nearly going to hospice and, and, and dying, frankly, to this thing shrinking down. Uh, and she's still on this drug with no sign of cancer because it shrunk even um, better than that since 2018. So these aren't common things. I can't promise I'm gonna find these things in every patient, they're rare. Okay, now someone important in the room, uh, Rob and, and Mary um, asked me to show a little bit uh, about another genetic change that we found. And specifically Mar Mary uh, uh, had this test where this was done in a tumor and this was the result that she shared with us. Um, so she gave me permission kindly. So there is this gene called HER2 or HERB2. Mark, let me just stop you. Just, oh, okay. uh, just as an aside, the cost, I even don't know, I think it was about 1500 about a year and a half ago, Medicare covered it. So, you know, one of the questions is, is it covered? At least under our Medicare <laughs> policy, it was covered. So that was also a nice handy uh, part of it. <laughs> so, so we found a gene that was mutated called ERB2, also known as HER2. It's mutated in 2% of breast cancer. Now there's another type of breast cancer where it's, it's genetically different than that, so called HER2 breast cancer. This isn't that. This is a mutation in the gene. Mm -hmm. And we have a clinical trial that's open, which includes a combination mm -hmm. of three drugs, two that turn off that HER2 or ERB2 gene, and one that blocks estrogen. And that has shown these uh, tumor responses where you can see on this so-called waterfall plot, each, plot, each bar is a person who got this drug, who had that mutation, and many of them, the tumor shrunk, as you can see, going below zero. So not all of them, but many of them, it shrunk. So that's something found in 2% of estrogen-driven breast cancers, and, and we have um, treatments for that. Okay, so there's a lot we can do to help our patients, but also <laughs> one of the missions that we have is to learn from our patients. So we're now trying to ask our patients to let us use their gene and genetic information to learn from them and then help future patients. So this was one patient, Peg, who, who came in and gave, also gave me permission to talk about her. And she came into clinic one day and told me a story that I was very surprised to hear, which was she had breast cancer in 1978. She knew Paul Carbone, because uh, it was back in the day. And then in the 80s, it became metastatic. But then she's been living with metastatic cancer ever since then which is pretty unusual. Next. So this is the, you know, the survival curve. So if you look at the pink line, that's for estrogen driven cancer. Uh, it shows you how long, you know, they, that people survive. So there's a distribution. So some people live a few years, some people live 10 or 15 years, as you can see, because that's about 10% still. But then next you get out to someone like uh, 20 years, that's pretty unusual. And next, and you get up to PEG and it's like 40. Mm -hmm. So something's unusual is going on. So what we want to do is learn from her and see if other people with metastatic cancer could mm -hmm. do stuff like she did, or if it's something intrinsic to the tumor, like a gene, which we could at least predict. So 
We wanted to know what made Peg tick and what makes her an extreme survivor. Is it something she does? Is it some sort of treatment? Although everyone in the 80s and 90s had access to the same treatment as her, so I don't think so, but maybe. And, or is it uh, a gene, maybe in the tumor? Next. So we started finding patients at UW. Um, we found one other person who had lived about 40 years, like Peg. Um, they tended to have hormone-driven breast cancer. Um, next. And this was sort of their characteristic. We found about 50 of them. Um, and uh, again, two-thirds of them had hormone-driven cancer, um, as you can see. Next. And they had various survivals. So this was their various survivals where each bar is a different person. So Peg and one other person were diagnosed in 1978, as you can see. Some others were diagnosed um, in the 80s as well. Next. But we needed to find a larger group of people. Like you know, there wasn't any one gene that these all these people had it had. So we started going on social media. We have national metastatic breast cancer groups support us. Um, the Susan Love Army of Women, and we launched this national survey um, where we recruited over a thousand people with metastatic breast cancer. Next. And they came from all over the country. We had every state but Wyoming. I don't know why not Wyoming, but um, and a couple uh, of countries outside of the US. Next. And this was their survival curves um, or their time from initial diagnosis to when they filled out the survey. And as you can see, there are a handful of people more than 20, 30, and even 40 years there, although many are shorter than that. Next. And we asked them, why did you live so long? You know, maybe, maybe they know. Um, so they had a lot of ideas, uh, you know, about, uh, about this. Um, so that, that was interesting. So you can read a few of them if you like. <laughs> but what we learned is, you know, we tried to track down the things they do that they told us in survey, in the survey. We found some weak correlations with it, about their surgery, about whether they participated in research and their obesity. Their obesity was ne negatively correlated, but they were very modest. They didn't really correlate very well with how long they survived. Um, in the treatment domain, there were clearly two different groups. There were groups where the tumors shrunk a lot from treatment and disappeared. And then there was this other group where the tumors never shrunk at all, and they just kind of stayed where they were very, and very slowly changed over decades. Um, so that seems to be more than a treatment. And then we're in progress testing genes. We're, you know, since we now have the human genome testing, we're testing 20,000 genes and in our top 50 survivors. Next. So that's all I have to say. So again, we're learning how to help our patients and we're learning um, about targeting the right drug, but we're also learning from our patients. And hopefully that builds into the future as we understand what drives these unique characteristics of cancer. So thank you to, to more for stage four and Rob and Mary. Uh, I wanna highlight that. And thank you all, all, all of you for your attention. Questions? Well, Mark, I'll add a little thing because you touched on it for Mary. And uh, I gave a program back, I don't know, what was it, March or whatever, on the who, what, where, why of clinical trials. So the trial that Mary's on now, this is her second one she's on, is because of that certain mutation that if we didn't know about that mutation, we would have never thought of that trial. So when her oncologist, you know, when they, when she did that uh, genome, they had the mutation, uh, Dr. Wazinski and Mark definitely jumped in and said, hey, you know, when, when that first clinical trial drug became resistant, guess what? We have in our pocket this other trial for you, which as a uh, metastatic survivor, having something in your pocket is a, is a critical element to know that, okay, at least there is some alternative out there because now when you're at very stage where she's gone through all the normal drugs you see on TV, that now you're really looking at what special drugs are there for my specific cancer. So it was nice to have, it's called a summit trial. 
there. It's been going on what two, three years even. Yep, that's right. Uh, and and we were able to open that because of this program. Because at first they're like, "Why should we do that? You're not testing anyone." But once you start testing, you can uh, have access to these. So, so we're keeping our fingers crossed because actually. She has to go nine weeks on it to see if it's working. So we'll have those scans done at the end of this month to see if this combination of drugs are working or not. But it's uh, we're very fortunate to one to have a clinical trial and two to be in Wisconsin, where it's just down the street. You know, we don't have to drive from way up northern Wisconsin to some other place that this trial was actually here. Because these trials often only happen in maybe 30, 40 locations around the country. So it's Really fortunate that it was right here for us. Mark, can you comment on? So, a friend of mine's wife, who's um, fifth out of six sisters, and she is the fifth to get breast cancer out of. So, I mean, it's, there is something in the genetics, uh, you know, the family history line or something. Can you comment on, on, on the prevalence of that in, you know, in, in the genetics from that per that perspective? Yeah, in the in the general population, it seems to be about five, maybe about 5% of people have a gene we know about that predisposes them to, say, breast cancer. Among people with breast cancer, which is a different population, it boils down to like 10%. And the most common genes are called B breast cancer 1 and breast cancer 2, BRCA1 and BRCA2. And as opposed to most of the things I talk about, I talk about things that are specific to the tumor that are not inherited in families. BRCA1 and 2 are inherited in families, and they get further modified in, in the tumor. So that's maybe one exception to what I talked about. Yes? Would it be worthwhile to test for that genetic makeup say during a blood test or something, rather than mammograms, which often have false positives and cause a lot of anxiety in other ways, or is that cost prohibitive to do um, a genetic test? So the, as I said, like about 10% of people who have breast cancer have a genetic gene, a gene but 90% don't. Yeah. So I think you'd miss a lot. We are collaborating with Exact Sciences. You might remember those are the people who we get all this poop sent to UW <laughs> to Madison uh, because they do Coligard. I saw it on the football game this weekend and that. So they are also working with us on a blood test that might be able to pick up other types of cancer. Like colon cancer, it puts its DNA in the stool, so you can do that. But for breast cancer, ovarian cancer, other things, you need to pick that up in the bloodstream. So, so that is an active area of research. Yes. Um, I was diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer in 2005, and I uh, facilitated a support group for about 10 years after that. A couple times a year, we would bring in a research scientist to our support group uh, to talk about what was new uh, especially in prostate cancer treatment. And these guys were really, really excited at that particular time because previously advancements in treatment, you know, over the course of 10 years, you'd see just a little bit of progress. Um, but at that time in the, in the late 90s, there were some tremendous strides being made uh, in the various forms of treatment. So I'm just wondering where, where do you see cancer treatment at five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, um, you know, as opposed to the days when, you know, if you had uh, radiation, they burn as much good tissue as bad tissue. And um, yeah, where, where are we heading in the yeah, future? Yeah. So a couple things about that. Number one, uh, I think what we're going to use is use these types of gene tests to subclassify cancers and to say, not say you have prostate cancer, but you have prostate cancer with this specific gene and therefore, this is the best treatment. So I think there's going to be a lot more subtypes of cancer as we get the drugs um, that match those subtypes. We can see them now, but we don't have drugs for, for many of them. The second thing, getting back to the uh, blood test, there's a very big interest, and we have a collaboration with Exact Sciences on this, 
is could we use a blood test to de detect what we call minimal residual disease, which means after we remove your tumor surgically, there's always a question about whether there's cancer cells left behind. So people have radiation and breast cancer, they have chemotherapy. But the question is, could we use these blood tests to determine whether Ms. Smith is the one with hidden cancer cells and Ms. Cooper is the one without hidden cancer cells, then we'd only do radiation and chemotherapy on Ms. Smith. So I think there may be a better chance at detecting that. And the reason we couldn't do it before is because people were trying to detect proteins, but you can't amplify a protein signal. You can detect it, you're fairly sensitive, but with DNA tests, you can amplify that signal to the point where you can see one molecule of mutated DNA. So it's much more sensitive, which is why, you know, exact sciences and some of our scientists are working on that. So, so I see those as big um, areas for progress. Has there been any cross references with all with environmental? Uh, my maternal grandmother died of metastatic breast cancer in 64. Well, that was just horrendous compared to what's available now, but I read something a couple of weeks ago that the federal government approved 30,000 new chemicals in the last 10 years. That's on top of all the ones we've had since whatever. So, I mean, that's hard to track. It's lifestyle stuff, but who's doing what with what? But I mean, is there any cross-reference with the other than the known carcinogens that we've got? I mean, there's just so much stuff out there. So one way people are trying to get at that is by looking at the mutational patterns in the cancers. There's certain patterns that are characteristic of certain mutagens. So for example, in lung cancer and smokers, there's actually a very specific pattern of where the mutations occur in the DNA. Um, and you can also see it in uh, pretty clearly in melanoma, where it's, there's a pattern specific to UV light in breast cancer, there are several different patterns. Um, none of them are clearly associated with a chemical. Some of them may be linked to a gene that can be turned on and off in breast tissue. So I would say that's still an active area of investigation. There's no smoking gun. And I can right. say yeah. in breast cancer, there tends to be fewer mutations than melanoma and lung cancer. So by that, respect, it doesn't look like um, right. a chemical mutagen. But um, again, uh, that, that's an area of active investigation. Right. Yes. Are mammograms uh, effective in finding cancer, especially in the dense breast tissue? They're less effective in seeing in dense breast tissue than non-dense. And keep in mind that most women have dense pre breast mm -hmm. premenopausal and it becomes less, sorry, more dense pre and less dense postmenopausal. It tends to change over time. Um, I think some of the data that we have about the detection is based on older mammogram technology. However, the newer mammograms have a much higher resolution and they have 3D. So that might be overcome in part. Um, but I'm less sure. Uh, now, one of the areas why mammograms have been controversial is because if you just say, how many lives are you saving? Let's just measure how many lives. And you take women between 50 and 70 and you do mammograms on them every year, you save about one life in 400. And that's because in part, the really bad cancers show up between the annual mammograms. They just grow really fast. And it's in part because the slow growing cancers, why it might not have mattered if you found it two, two years later mm -hmm. um, because they were so slow growing. So it's just those middle, that middle ground that you're picking up and really making a difference. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems to save one life in you know, 400 is three or 400, depending on the age. Are you seeing more breast cancer now than they used to per 100,000 people? Or? Um, so the death rate, mortality went down over the past 30 years um, because of better detection or treatment. The incidence That's went up when screening mammograms became common because right. we started finding these low-risk breast cancers and these pre-invasive cancers. Right. 
So it went up fat high there, and then it kind of leveled off. And then you re might recall the Women's Health Initiative that reported in 2003, that hormone replacement uh, did not protect against heart attacks. In fact, it promoted them a little bit. So a lot of people stopped their hormone replacement therapy and we could see a discernible dip in the number of um, breast cancers diagnosed after that. So it's kind of been up and down. Yes. You mentioned risk, Harry. Are we getting better at detecting which initial breast cancer patients are at a higher risk for recurrence? I think some of the gene tests that I didn't talk about help with that. Um, so yeah, I think there have been some advances in trying to better stratify who's at higher risk. I can tell you the old fashioned stage, meaning tumor size and the number of lymph nodes the cancer goes to and the subtype of breast cancer, those are still the primary determinants. Keep up the good work. Yeah, well, thank you all for having me. This is really thank you so much. Um, just wanted to make sure we don't have any questions on Zoom. Oh, okay. All right. Well, um, we make a donation on behalf of all of our speakers and we'll, on your behalf as well to the Employee Now initiative that is part of Rotary International. And um, Dan, our speaker next week. Next week, we will hear from Walter Dewey from Resident Capital Advisors, mm -hmm. who will provide us with a state of the stock market and the Madison South Rotary Foundation investments. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for joining us by Zoom or in person. And Make sure you take a cookie if you're here because there's lots of extra cookies. Oh, uh, Snickerdoodles. <laughs> See you guys next week. <laughs>